Welcome everyone to our series of lectures and this is lecture 16. This series is on fluids and electrolytes and this is my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. These lectures will explain and expand on the topics discussed in my book. This is the book. You can find more information in the description and it is available on Amazon as a paperback or as an ebook. We are still on chapter two and chapter two is hypokalemia and this is part two of hypokalemia. Let's summarize what we talked about in the previous lecture. We talked about potassium homeostasis. We said that most of the potassium in the body is intracellular inside the cells, 3,000 to 4,000 mill equivalents, while only 2% is in the extracellular compartment, only 60 to 80 mill equivalents. Most of the potassium is in the muscles, 70%, while in the red blood cells, erythrocytes, bone and liver, we have 7% in each of those compartments. Now, potassium excretion, 90% is renally, 10% is in the stool. We also discussed uh, in some detail the anatomy of the nephron, and we said that as far as potassium, 65% of filtered potassium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. 25% in the loop of Henle, 10% in the distal tubule. If you add that up, you reach the conclusion that potassium is filtered and then almost completely reabsorbed. Then how does potassium get into the urine? It gets into the urine by secretion. Where? In the collecting tubule. So potassium excretion is by secretion. Where? By the collecting tubule. Now, the collecting tubule has two parts, cortical and medullary. Now, we said that in the cortical collecting tubule or the cortical collecting duct, we have two types of cells, principal cells, which absorb sodium and secrete potassium under the effect of aldosterone, while the other type is the intercalated cells, and those cells maintain acid-base balance. Now, in this lecture, let's talk about other things. There are two types of potassium channels that concern us, and uh, this is in the cortical collecting duct. Now, do they exist elsewhere? Is there a ROMK channel, say, in the thick ascending limb? Yes, but le let's limit ourselves to what we need. Okay, let's discuss potassium channels in the cortical collecting duct. There are two kinds of potassium channels the renal outer medullary potassium channel. Rather than saying that whole big sentence, we're going to call it a ROMK. And the maxi potassium channels, and we are going to abbreviate it as BK. BK stands for big potassium. Okay, the ROMK channels are activated by aldosterone, while the maxi K channels or BK channels are activated via high fluorate through the collecting tubule. Every time the urine flows through the collecting tubules, you have some potassium secretion through these channels, and the higher the flow, the higher the secretion. Where are they located? The ROMK channels are located in the principal cells, while the maxi K channels exist not only in the principal cells, but also in the intercalated cells, those cells we said regulate acid-base balance, and they come in alpha and beta types. More on that when we discuss metabolic acidosis. Now, the major potassium excretory channel is the ROMK, so its role in potassium secretion is major, while the role of the MAXI-K, the BK channels, is minor. Let's look at that in more detail. Now, Potassium is not like sodium, so the kidneys cannot preserve potassium 99.9%. So there's an obligatory loss. 
10, 15 mole equivalents per day. So there's always some potassium excretion, even if you have hypokalemia. So to the far left, we have the situation low potassium excretion, okay? So let's say that we have someone with hypokalemia. The BK channel is going to be closed, while the ROMK is going to be sequestered. So we're going to have some secretion, but not a lot. Now, under normal conditions, the ROMK is going to be open. So under physiologic conditions, the ROMK channel is always going to be open. You're always going to have some potassium secretion. While there is no need for the BK, uh, PK channels to be open because the ROMK is doing the job. Now, if you have high flow, okay, if you have a situation of high potassium excretion, then both channels are going to be open. So the ROMK channels and the BK channels, we said BK is the same as MAXIK. So the ROMK is regulated by aldosterone while the BK is, is regulated by high flow. So the higher the flow of urine, then the more excretion you're going to have. So if someone is drinking a lot of water, well, you're going to have more potassium excretion. If someone is on a diuretic, you're going to have more potassium excretion because of these BK channels. They are four major factors that determine potassium secretion in the collecting duct, okay? And we have to remember those aldosterone, I underlined it, because this is by far the most important. Disulfluorate, we just talked about that. Serum potassium itself is a regulator of potassium and delivery of anions to the collecting duct. Let's talk a little bit about each. Aldosterone, as a reminder, where does aldosterone come from? From the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands have three zones uh, in the cortex. We have the zona glomerulosa, where aldosterone comes from, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis, where cortisol and androgens come. Now, the medulla, this is where catecholamines come from, and uh, I, I put also the structure of uh, aldosterone, okay? So aldosterone comes from the adrenal glands from the zona glomerulosa. So the major determinant of potassium secretion is aldosterone. I've said that so many times, so now you know it by heart. What, yeah, what it does, it enhances potassium absorption and K excretion by activation of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And also it opens potassium channels. Now, the sodium potassium ATPase pump, as we said, it's on the basolateral membrane of the principal cell, not just the principal cell, in, in every cell. And they maintain the balance. We said you get three sodium out and two potassium in, and this way you're keeping the outside of the cell positive, the inside negative. You probably studied action potential, and, and this is very relevant to that discussion. We don't need to talk about action potential and nerve transduction now. Aldosterone also activates the epithelial sodium channel, also called ENAC, in the epical membrane of the principal cell of the collecting duct. And when you're absorbing sodium, you're creating a negative charge because sodium is positive. When it's going in, it's going to leave a negative charge behind. And this stimulates what? Another positive ion or a cation, which is potassium, to go out. So when a positive charge goes in, another positive charge goes out. And this happens through the ROMK channel. Now, I drew this, I simplified it. We looked at different uh, diagram in the previous lecture. Either one is fine. Now, as you can see, the sodium potassium ATPase pump is located on the basolateral membrane, not just of the principal cell, of any cell. And what's going to do is going to let three sodium go out for two potassiums to go in. Aldosterone is going to bind to a receptor. It's called the aldosterone mineralocorticoid receptor. So when it binds to this receptor, it's going to activate the sodium ATPase pump, sodium potassium ATPase pump, and also the ENAC, the epithelial sodium channel, which is located, as you can see, on the epical, on the apical membrane of the principal cells. So once this channel is 
activated, sodium is going to go into the cell. This is going to leave a negative charge behind in the lumen and potassium is going to go out via the ROMK, the renal outer medullary potassium channel that we just talked about. So this should be very clear by now. Distal fluorate, we said when you have more urine flowing, flowing through the collecting duct, you're going to have more potassium. So if you're giving someone a lot of IV fluids, if you're giving someone a lot of diuretics, if someone is drinking a lot of water, you're going to increase potassium secretion. How does that happen? Well, this flow, this high flow activates the big potassium channels, the maxi K channels or the PK channels, all the same name. And there's an obligatory loss of potassium, like we said, 10, 15 milliequivalents per day. It's not like sodium when you have a fractional excretion of 99.99%. The, the kidneys can absorb 99.99% of sodium. That cannot happen with potassium. So now you know one of the reasons why you're going to get low potassium for someone who's drinking way too much water, or if you're giving fluids with no potassium, or if you're giving diuretics, is the enhancement of the distal fluorate, the opening of the BK channels, and the loss of potassium. Number three, serum potassium itself is a regulator of potassium. So when you have hyperkalemia, you're going to increase aldosterone secretion directly from the zona glomerulosa, and that's going to enhance potassium excretion. On the other hand, when you have hypokalemia, this will suppress aldosterone and preserve potassium. So that's simple enough. Lastly, delivery of anion to the collecting tubule will enhance potassium excretion. So anion increased lumen negativity, and when you have increased negativity, potassium is going to come out. This is, we, we just said, aldosterone is going to enhance sodium entrance or entry into the cell. This will leave a negative charge behind, and then potassium will come out. Same, same concept here. This is what happens in metabolic alkalosis. This is one of the reasons for hypokalemia in metabolic alkalosis. You have this increased excretion of bicarbonate. Bicarbonate has a negative charge, so potassium is going to go out due to increased lumen negativity. Or if you have a non-absorbable anion, such as nafcillin, this is like a favorite question on, on a test. Someone who has endocarditis on a big dose of nafcillin, and now they have hypokalemia, and you cannot explain it. Why? Because nafcillin is a negatively charged ion, or it's an anion, and therefore is going to increase lumen negativity and subsequently excretion of potassium. Now I'm going to stop here, and uh, next lecture we're going to talk about the exciting world of aldosterone paradox. We're going to attempt to explain the unexplainable, the aldosterone paradox. See you then.